Most of modern economics relies in one way or another of turning Say's law on its head and saying, no, 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 what we need to do is stimulate demand. The problem is people are not particles of an ideal gas. These two worldviews are awfully tough to reconcile. You're just liquidating the very, the very stuff that makes it possible for us to be wealthier and enjoy more. And it's a fundamental chasm, you know, production or consumption. You're liquidating that in one final orgy of, you know, drunken revel. Well, how did we get rich? And what if it all went away? Welcome to the Gold Exchange Podcast, where we untangle market and policy complexity using timeless economic principles. For show notes and archives, go to goldexchangepodcast.com. Now, on to today's episode. Welcome back to the Gold Exchange Podcast. My name is Benjamin Nadelstein. I'm joined today by founder and CEO of Monetary Metals, Keith Weiner, and our special guest, former president of the Mises Institute and soon-to-be general counsel of Monetary Metals, Jeff Dice. Jeff, how are you doing today? Well, thanks a lot. I'm excited. Uh, appreciate it, Ben. Appreciate being here with Keith. I've watched a lot of your podcasts and seen a lot of your guests, so uh, this is my inauguration, so it's great to be here. Excited to have you, Jeff. So let's jump right in. Why did you choose to join Monetary Metals, which is a for-profit institution, instead of staying with a nonprofit organization like the Mises Institute? I mean, with your background, you chose Monetary Metals over other financial organizations like maybe the IMF, the World Bank, or maybe working for another political campaign. Why'd you choose us, Jeff? Yeah, I'm not so sure the World Bank would have me, uh, but I, I definitely would not have them. Uh, I've known Addison Quale for a while. I've known Keith also for a while. I'm familiar with his work. And obviously there's a nice dovetail in that my own perspective on money and banking uh, it is one that's heavily influenced by a lot of the famous gold standard writing. Uh, and, and so you know, I'm, I'm obviously a big believer in sound currency. So monetary metals was a, a good fit and an easy fit. The nonprofit question's interesting because you have to ask yourself, what's the best form of persuasion in society, right? That's, that's an interesting question. And I think the idea of a company being successful and, and especially becoming profitable, you know, it's, we believe that profits are socially beneficial. A, a lot of people dispute that. But nonetheless, I think in the monetary metals world, if you accept that, then the challenge is to go out and unlock some of this moneyness. Hayek used that term, that there can be degrees of moneyness. The moneyness of gold is a really intriguing idea. And so I, I do think that uh, all kinds of persuasion are important. I do think there, there are great nonprofits out there. I think the Mises Institute is important in its role. But I also like the idea of the marketplace proving out the idea that gold still has monetary uses. Uh, the, you know, Keith's basically trying to create a proof of concept here that um, we can create a yield on gold and, and that all those hundreds of thousands of tons of metric tons of gold that are sitting out there in the world somewhat fallow, uh, it doesn't have to be that way. And, and so that, that's an intriguing proposition to me. And it's, it's, personally, it's just nice to work with like-minded people uh, uh, towards a mission that I, that I agree with uh, conceptually. And, and you know, it's not just a job for a paycheck. You know, if I can just add um, to, to what Jeff just said, not only is this profitable for us, it's profitable first and foremost for our clients. We're, we're making it profitable for them to move forward to the gold standard, um, which is also socially beneficial, uh, as well as one heck of an incentive. Uh, Jeff, I'm sure you're familiar with that quote from Keynes, where he says, there's no surer way to overthrow the capitalist order, but which, which means overthrow civilization, right? Because if you replace it with pure and perfect, communism or, or some sort of statism, that's actually collapse. There's no surer, surer way to overthrow, I'm gonna say it uh, my way, uh, civilization than by debauching the money. And um, he goes on and on and on. And then at the end he says, um, by engaging all the hidden forces of economics, which today we would use the word incentives, by, by engaging, you know, by, by offering the right or the wrong incentives, we can get people to destroy their world and he's gloating, smirking, this bastard. I call him a vicious bastard in print. The only time I ever dropped an F-bomb in any written piece that I, that I put was that Keynes was a vicious bastard. That was my article. Um, <clears throat> he's gloating that not one in a million can diagnose what's happening to their world because he's saying we're cleverly wink, wink, nudge, nudge, and then Cass Sunstein sense of nudge people 
uh, with these perverse incentives, we get perverse outcomes, and they can't even figure out how they're um, you know, drilling holes in their own boat, and the boat is sinking. And um, that was one of the uh, formative, you know, the, the ideas that came from me thinking about that was one of the sort of formative ideas of monetary metals. Okay, the system offers these perverse incentives. How do you reverse this? Well, you have to offer a different incentive. And what's that incentive? That incentive is offering interest on gold. And so, um, yeah, we're going to make money at this. Um, there's a good business here. And um, the customers make money at this. And by money, I mean gold, of course. And um, if you align all that right, then um, you get beyond uh, proof of concept and into you know something that can actually move the needle of the world. And I'm uh, I'm looking forward to uh, to getting to that phase. Well, it's it's interesting you bring up Cass Sunstein, and of course he was lauded for what I consider that absurd book nudge. I mean, it's not exactly novel in economics or otherwise to suggest that incentives matter. <laughs> And that people respond to incentives. I'm not so sure that that deserves much praise. But more importantly, the incentives he's talking about are not what we would consider the win-win market incentives. No, he, exactly. He's talking about using state power to nudge people towards what is a po politically determined proper behavior. And so that, that you know the kind of incentives he implies are very different than the incentives of the marketplace. That's what it's all about today. And you look at every last program they've got every last three-letter agency, every last, you know, welfare, bailout, subsidy, they're all, well, let's just substitute state coercion for, you know, market forces. And then, oh, that didn't break the world yet. Okay, that means they can, let's pile on another one. Oh, that hasn't broken it yet either. We can pile on another one. Let's see how far we can get away with this. And uh, anyways, I don't, I don't want to dwell too much on that uh, today, but um, I think I think we're in violent agreement uh, on that. And Keith, what I find so interesting is this Andrew Breitbart quote saying, politics is downstream of culture. But I'd like to add that it seems money is upstream of everything. That when these kind of monetary incentives, interest rates obviously being one of the biggest factors, are you know centrally planned, artificially changed, that this changes everything below it from politics to culture. Uh, Jeff, how do you see the kind of irredeemable currency system that we're currently on, that America mm. has been severely on since 1971, affecting the culture, the politics, the finances of the United States? It's really fascinating because it's it's such an untold story, an unremarked upon story. In other words, I would consider the monetary profl profligacy, I call it monetary hedonism of the past several decades, maybe the biggest unwritten story uh, you know, of our lifetime, certainly for financial journalists, in the sense that it, it does affect everything about us in terms of our time preference, our actions, and what we want from economists. Let's let's remember, economists are social scientists, right? They they are supposed to help us understand the unseen, right? Bastiat talks about the unseen. You know, so how do we explain the unseen? It's very easy to take a government policy, tax some people, take the money, build, have a bunch of cronious. Uh, get paid and build a big public housing project and put some poor people in there. And so the politician can say, see, look, you know, look, you know, this, this works. We built some housing. But what economists are supposed to help us understand is the unseen costs of that, right? What were the alternatives? What were the opportunity costs? What was lost as a result of that money being forcibly taken and put it into a project that the market otherwise would not have chosen? And so with money, you know, so much of it is unseen. If, if you go out and if you've been shopping for a car lately, it's absolutely hellish. I mean, car dealerships have like 20 cars. And then, you know, the used cars are very expensive right now. But nonetheless, you probably go online, you probably do some research, you probably talk to some family members and say, hey, you know, I think this new uh, Honda Pilot is, is great. I have one. I had one before. You know, I'm looking at all the consumer reports. It gets very good ratings. So that half of the equation, the good or service being purchased for money, you know, you, you tend to do a little bit of research on that. But on the other side of that equation, Honda just gets the money. So is Honda spending all of its time engineering cars or is it spending all of its time sort of looking at monetary policy and wondering about what's going to happen to the dollar? And what's, what's the quality of this dollar I'm getting relative to the quality of this Honda Pilot I'm selling? And so because the market works, at least over time and, and in the broad sense, 
in, in a we, in a way, we know Honda kind of does have to look at the quality of that dollar, and they kind of have to price that in. Now, that's imperfect, but nonetheless, there's two sides to every equation, and we spend a lot of time thinking about goods and services, but we don't spend much time thinking about the other half of that, the, the dollar itself or whatever currency, and the idea that there is almost a Politburo of central planners at the Fed, the Fed, the Open Markets Committee, the Plunge Protection Team, you know, as it was once called, sort of sitting around making these decisions the way Honda properly in the private sphere is sitting around making its decisions. That's that is that's an untold story. And I think as a country that that hasn't served us well. Keith, let's go to you about that untold story on kind of every side of the equation. One of those sides is the dollar or, you know, our credit today is the dollar. It could be gold and you could analyze gold and, and a transaction. We've had uh, um, Jeff Snyder on the podcast mm -hmm. and Jeff mentioned that in transactions on the foreign exchange market, that the dollar is on over 90, maybe 95 percent of those transactions. Is it 96 percent of dollars on one side of every derivative or 96 percent of all the derivatives? He said it's not the dollar and other currencies. It's a dollar system. And I think of the other currencies as kind of like a coal mining town has their little scrip. Mm -hmm. And then coal mining towns agree to trade scrip. Oh, see the end of the dollar head pony. No, exactly. Um, yeah, they've created a very perverse world. And, and to build on what Jeff just said, um, you know, the CEO of Honda has to be thinking about monetary policy. Absolutely does. Because if interest rates are headed down, then that's one set of incentives for him. And if interest rates are going to be forced up, then that's a whole different set of incentives for him and his customers. And companies that get the business cycle wrong go out of business. Companies that, and we call it the business cycle, it really should be called the Fed's unnecessary and artificial credit cycle. Um, the Fed's binge and purge cycle, I call it. Um, if you get that wrong, then you go out of business because you're investing at precisely the wrong time. You're going to get creamed. And then you don't, if you still survive that, you don't have the capital when we finally hit the bottom of the V or the U and start going up. And that's when your competitors are investing and you've spent all your dry powder and you're just clinging on for your life. You know, you're losing market share and, and technology edge and all those things. Um, absolutely, everybody's affected by the gyrations of this. And I think one, one interesting thing that needs to be pointed out, <clears throat> the Fed is by far the greatest employer of monetary economists. I mean, what an enormous distortion. Imagine if we had a, a free market, I mean, I'm gonna shudder to think, uh, you know, an actual free market. <clears throat> what, you know, what a, what a diverse set of opinions you might have amongst monetary economists. And some of them might be for central planning, some of them might be otherwise, but you at least have this full spectrum. But everyone, everyone in the monetary economics field understands the Fed is the source of most of the, uh, the juice in that field. And even if you don't work for the Fed today, you don't necessarily want to say views that would make you unhirable because you might want to work for the Fed tomorrow, or you might want the Fed to give a grant <laughs> to your university. You don't want to be ungrantable or whatever the term might be in, in, in that space. Um, so I I, uh, I totally agree, Jeff, that um, economists are, are supposed to be social scientists. Unfortunately, there's three types of, uh, of people calling themselves economists today. And the, 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 people, the actual scientists, the ones that actually want to discover the truth, wherever that may lead, are pretty small. It, it seems to me, certainly in the monetary area, a pretty small minority. Um, most of them are either the dirigists, the ones that just get off on having their hands over the levers as they attempt to, you know, I guess the mainstream believe fine-tune the economy, in reality, dispense, uh, you know, favors and, and punishments as they will, um, and as they try to build their, when people talk about Jay Powell building his legacy, I'm like, legacy? He's he's destroying, um, and he wants to get the, the message just right, and Ayn Rand had a lot to say about second-handers, people that don't actually care that they're causing harm, they're just concerned about crafting their image. Um, anyway, so one type of uh, uh, people calling themselves economists is the central planner, and then the other type, I call them the court economists, the people that um, you know peddle the message. They either they're not in the in the seat of power right now, but either they want to be or they're just happy to be the paid, you know, hack, just a shill for the uh, for the system. 
um, and they put out all of this rubbish um, that, <clears throat> you know, is, is, a, is a drug, it's a sulfuric sort of, there, there would be a lot of outrage against the Fed and what it does if it wasn't for this endless outpouring, this damping effect where they're constantly putting wet towels on it to tamp it down. Um, and uh, there's an awful lot of economists, uh, people calling themselves economists who make their living, um, you know, in the, you know, I'll call it the indirect employ of, uh, of the system. Um, and it seems like there's all too few that are actually trying to pursue the truth. Uh, of course, the truth has one advantage that the lie can never overcome, which is the truth has the advantage of being true, of being in accord with reality. And so, um, you know, one lone voice or a couple of lone voices can, uh, can ultimately change the world. Uh, who was it who said, was it Voltaire? Nothing can stop an idea whose time has come. And I think gold as a, as a reemergence of the monetary system, I think fits Voltaire's, uh, um, you know, rubric. Well, Keith, I, I want to step in there for a second uh, and, and let me push back from the other side. So there's all these PhD economists, and I think you are accurate and right that 90% of those economists end up either being hired by the Fed or in touch with the Fed in some way. But I mean, Keith, these are Nobel Memorial Prize winning economists like Ben Bernanke, Paul Krugman. Um, are, are you really saying that, you know, the kind of Keynesian model of stimulating, borrowing, spending to improve the economy, that, that's the kind of Keynesian approach is wrong? And it's the Austrian kind of school who is right and these other kind of free market wackos? I mean, uh, so are the PhDs wrong? Uh, I mean, what are these highly decorated individuals missing that Austrians are getting right? When you, when you frame it that way, how could how can anybody possibly say that? But um, I, I'm not normally a big favor of ad hominem, but isn't the Nobel Prize um, sort of administered by the Ricks Bank? I did I did say memorial because I know Dr. Bob Murphy is is very uh, is probably going to watch it and keep an eye on me for saying that. And Jeff, what about you? The Austrian school? I I don't know. Janet Yellen's not an Austrian. Paul Krugman's not an Austrian. Ben Bernanke's not an Austrian. Right. Why should we listen to Austrians? Well, I, first, I would say that you can be very, very, very intelligent and disagree. I, I mean, I think Ben Bernanke is a, a very intelligent guy. Certainly, Alan Greenspan is. Uh, and from what I've heard from people like Danielle DiMartino Booth, I know you recently interviewed her. I mean, Jerome Powell is, is a really smart guy. He's a lawyer rather than an economist. So he just read and read and read to prepare himself for the role as Fed chair. So I, I don't discount for a second the intelligence of, of most, not all. Uh, you know, uh, of what I think he correctly, correctly describes as court economists. But I, I mean, we can view all these different schools. Obviously, I, I'm pro-Austrian. We can view all these different mentalities. We can view the politicization of central bankers. But at the end of the day, for me, it, it comes down to one of two viewpoints. I mean, take away total destructive Marxism or, or pure socialism or something like that, where you're not even really talking about an economy at that point. You're talking about a command and control world. But it, within economics itself, you know, there, there's scarcity. Scarcity means there's choice and trade-offs. Um, and so if we go back to Say's law, Jean-Baptiste Say, I mean, there's two ways to view the economy. One is that you have to produce things and that production creates its own demand. In other words, uh, we all have to go out and do what we do to make a living, unless we're a trust fund kid or something. We have to go out and do what we do to make a living. And with that salary or pay or business income, that's what allows us to purchase a home or to buy groceries or to do things with our family or whatever we might do. In other words, our production, our work creates our ability to consume and demand. And I, I think most of modern economics relies in one way or another, a turning Say's law on its head and saying, no, 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 what we need to do is stimulate demand uh, through, through you know, either monetary policy or fiscal policy. We need to make people wanna buy more stuff and when people buy more stuff, that's how you create a healthier economy. I, I don't think that's true. I think you create a healthier economy by creating the conditions for greater capital investment and hence greater productivity. And so th these two worldviews are awfully tough to reconcile. I mean, it's not just a, a, you know, a rhetorical or academic debate amongst economists. I mean, it's a fundamental chasm, you know, production or consumption. Um, and, and obviously they're interrelated, but if you don't accept the idea of Say's law, I, I'm not sure that there's that there's a lot farther we can go in a discussion beyond that. 
Keith, I want to head your way. Say's law. So do we believe that we can kind of centrally plan our way to prosperity? We can just regulate our way to riches. We need to stimulate some more demand. I think the central question, with, which Jeff put so well, is can we print our way to wealth? What do you think, Keith? I, I could only share an anecdote. Um, so my wife and uh, some of her uh, girlfriends at work wanted to go see Adele who is um, uh, in residence in, uh, I think it's Caesars in Las Vegas. Uh, so she has a young kid, so she just wants to park herself in Vegas and she has a 4,000 seat theater that she plays to, I don't know how many days a week. And then they sell these seats. So apparently you can't just go and like buy a ticket the way you could for Phantom of the Opera or Blue Man Group or whatever. No, like you have to get into a process. You have to win a lottery to get a place in line where then they'll tell you what at what your appointed hour is where you can log in and um, actually have the opportunity to buy the ticket. So she and her uh, friends discussed um, you know, what they were willing to pay, I, I presume what her friends were able to pay. And um, so uh, Joyce was all excited. She got her, they all entered the lottery. Um, Joyce was the only one who actually won and had the right to go participate in this. I don't know if it's an auction or whatever. Um, anyway, then her point of hour came up and the prices were like triple what they had all sort of agreed as a group because she, you know, she was going to buy the tickets for her friends. You can buy up to four if, if you win. So she was going to buy, but anyways, it, there was a way about, it was like triple what they had all agreed. And, um, you know, just looking at that one incident right there, there's an enormous amount of stimulus that's still overstimulating people. This is not, and people will just dismiss it and say inflation and money printing. You know, whatever easing that the Fed may have done and now is, is doing more of with this new term bank facility, whatever they're calling it, basically repo. None of this is making its way to consumers, people who work for, you know, my wife's an engineer at a major tech company. These are engineers. Nobody got raises like this. Um, and, um, you know, who 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 is outbidding you know, senior engineers and 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 people to, to go see this Adele concert. There's people out there, a lot of them that still are on an eviction moratorium or a foreclosure moratorium, essentially paying zero for their living space. And um, so this is highly stimulative. These people are going to Las Vegas, spending, in some cases, thousands of dollars a seat to go see, and that's just one concert. I don't know what they're paying to see the sports game. I don't know what they're gambling. <clears throat> I don't know what high-end restaurants they're going to in Las Vegas. It's pretty easy to spend a thousand dollars a seat uh, for dinner if you go for some wine or drinks at some of those restaurants. And these people are spending up a storm. It's all stimulated, stim stimulated. I don't think that's. But I don't think very much of that is natural. Um, and um, is that good? Well, people enjoy the the drunken revel. You know, they enjoy the orgy while it lasts. Anyway. Um, and the problem is, of course, it doesn't last. And, you know, there's a lot of different looks. Mises talks about the crack of boom. You know, if you just continue to try to force it uh, to go on forever, you get the crack of boom. You know, there's a lot of different ways of looking at it. But, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm with Jeff. If, if somebody is in basic denial over this, if someone says it's just a matter of managing the demand function or, or these, I call them the otherwise free marketers, like George Selgin, uh, promoting this idea of nominal GDP targeting. Essentially, the Fed should print as much as necessary to keep nominal GDP um, not only you know steady, but actually increasing at whatever magic K percent per year that they think that it should be increasing. Completely, not only heedless, but actually uncaring. Even if you explain it to them, they don't care that, okay, well, what you're talking about then is consumption of capital. You're just liquidating... The very, the very stuff that makes it possible for us to be wealthier and enjoy more, you're liquidating that in one final orgy of, you know, drunken revel. Um, and they're uncaring about that. It's just, you know, keep the GDP up at all costs. Well, we're keeping it up right now, and this is how. Yeah, I think there's a kind of saying or a quote, which is, you know, we're lighting the furniture on fire to keep ourselves warm. Right. Uh, it, it, it's true. We're, we're staying warm. The heat is, you know, high, but at what expense? What and that's how, you get, that's how you get around Say's law, right? You have to produce in order to consume. 
and they're enabling the semen consumption without production. Well, how, how is that possible? Well, you're consuming something that had been previously produced by somebody else that you got as capital, and now you're just burning the furniture and you can keep warm for an hour with that priceless furniture. Many people call capitalism free markets because they want to kind of highlight that voluntary aspect. But I'd like to focus on the actual capital aspect of the capitalism, which we've just brought up. Why, why is capital accumulation so important? Why is it more important than demand? Uh, why, why is capital accumulation so important to civilization? And Jeff, maybe why do Austrians specifically focus on capital structure and you know the nature of the capital structure in production? Why is capital so important? Well, it's interesting. One of the one of the big differences between the Austrian perspective and other views is the idea that there's a structure of production that capital is not homogenous. Uh, that capital, uh, you know, has stages of production, and over time, those stages lengthen, and that's the sign of an economy getting healthier and a society getting more prosperous. Uh, whereas, the I guess what we might call neo-Keynesian mainstream economics just <laughs> use capital as sort of a, uh, you know, a, 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 excuse me, I said earlier, Austrians view capital as heterogeneous. Uh, the the mainstream view says, well, it's just sort of homogenous. It's just an input. It's just a factor. And so uh, on top of that, uh, the Austrian school has a perspective that the entrepreneur is actually an agent acting within that structure of production, making decisions, taking risks. Uh, again, mainstream economics does not really have an explanation or an understanding of that person's role. They just view that as you know, entrepreneurs are widgets or widgets or inputs of some kind, which I, I don't think is correct if you look at how the world really works. And so you know, accumulating capital is what basically every generation has done for millennia. And that's why when we wake up in the morning, we're surrounded by roads and Starbucks and electricity and hot and cold running water and uh, a refrigerator full of food and, all, and mobile devices and all kinds of wonderful things. And so that capital accumulation, part of it is actually economic capital stock, you know, but part of it is also understanding education, know-how, wisdom, uh, some of it's cultural, some of it's social. There's all kinds of ways to define capital, some of it's human, but in the more narrow economic sense, uh, when capital accumulates, uh, people have the ability to forego current consumption and put that capital into other uses, to invest it, to put it into production, to put it into a new company, to put it into maybe spending money for a new idea or a new technology that won't pay off for a long time in the future, and as a matter of fact, may never pay off. It may turn out not to work. They may risk that capital and lose it. But the market has a way of, if left unmolested, of moving capital towards people who are better at using it, and, and people who are not as good at using it tend to lose it over time, all things equal. I'm not trying to be too kumbaya. You know, sometimes a rich kid comes along and blows his parents' inheritance or something. It's, this isn't all you know, uh, an ethical thing. It, it's, it's more just the way uh, capitalism works if allowed to work. And that, I think that's very important for us to understand that it is possible, entirely possible, for whole societies not only to go sideways, but actually go backwards. You know, how did we get rich? And what if it all went away? Those are questions we haven't had to ask ourselves in the West for a long, long time, because unlike, let's say, our grandparents or great grandparents, we have basically known a level of material prosperity, which makes us start to forget how we got here, that, you know, somehow iPhones grow on trees. Well, they don't grow on trees. And if we're not careful, if, we, if we're consuming capital rather than creating it, uh, we are going to leave future generations worse off. I mean, that, that really is a concern. I mean, that that does keep me up at night. Um, how did we get rich? It's it's something that you'd think economists would be studying instead of writing stupid books like Nudge. Keith, I want to send it your way. How do societies get rich? How is capital kind of involved in that? How did, let's say, a country like Hong Kong or, or Singapore become so rich while other countries have kind of stagnated? I was going to say, um, I have a term for what uh, Jeff was just talking about at the end, which is I, I use the term when people are aggressively indifferent to something. Mm. That, um, they're just curiously incurious. They don't know and don't want to know and actually get annoyed if you you know try to explain because the answer they fear that the answer leads 
to something that they would then have to check another of their premises and that would unravel everything that they believe. And so it's much easier to just, you know, ignore it and, and uh, you know, move on. Um, Singapore, I think is a bit of a different story. Um, <clears throat> was it 1960, 1963? It was all these, you know, the Malaysians kicked the British out. So, okay, we're gonna be independent. Obviously that was a post-war period and they're having all these elections and everything else. And essentially, the Malay decided they didn't want Singapore. The rest of uh, Malaysia is um, Malay majority, which is Muslim majority. Singapore is Chinese majority. So they're like, go away. We don't actually want you part of our country. Mm -hmm. So um, Lee uh, becomes the uh, premier or president, or what his title was, but effectively dictator of Singapore. And his insight was to say, Nobody is going to invest capital. We're just a third world jungle country, like so many others uh, at that time in the world. Ayn Rand actually used the term, she said, oh, developing nations. That was the politically correct term at the time. She said, not developed, not developing, never to, never to be developed. Well, there were two that did develop. And Singapore is one and Hong Kong, you know, is the other that were poor little island, you know, fishing village type places at the time. Lee's insight was to say, no one's going to trust us if they don't trust the rule of law and contract and property rights. Therefore, we're going to, as I understand it, he said, we're going to say that um, contract disputes, we're going to adopt English common law, and contract disputes will be tried in the Chancery Court in, in uh, London. And so if you invest here, it's not in the, not in the hands of a jungle dictator uh, to decide your fate, uh, but actually you know, a, real, a real justice court. And that uh, made it safe for you know corporations and banks to invest, and uh, it's the investment that um, you know grew the Singapore economy and the Singapore landscape. And today, it looks like a very, for the most part, looks like a modern city um, with some notable you know things. If you're an American and you're there, you're like hmm, this looks a little rinky dink. <clears throat> um, Hong Kong was uh, the case of benign neglect. It was a British protectorate. The British didn't care enough about it to bring all the really important things like socialism. Uh, they just sort of ignored it. And that was actually the perfect thing. Was it, um, what was his name, Copperthwaite? He actually was opposed to the idea of measuring a GDP um, because he didn't want the central planners to try to nudge people to get a better number that would look better on a report. So they actually didn't even want to measure the economy with some of these macro aggregate statistics like how much capital do we have? and um, they had, uh, you know, the rule of law from the Brits and not a lot else. And then, you know, built this thriving economy that, um, uh, you know, was really the marvel of the world um, and not so much anymore, but that's a whole different story. Um, I, my informal definition, I'm not sure I would state this as a formal definition, but my informal definition of capital is that which gives leverage to human effort so it multiplies human effort and, and production specifically. So that would include getting a degree. That would include management and organizational DNA. So if you take 10 people that know a bunch of things and you organize them into a particular business structure um, and over time make all the managerial and entrepreneurial decisions to slot everybody in the right role and build the right you know, communication systems between them, that actually represents a significant investment in capital. And then if the Fed hikes rates and then that destroys that firm and that firm goes away, well, that capital is now lost ir irrevocably. Um, and so obviously capital also includes, um, you know, cranes and drill rigs and factories and machines and uh, trucks, um, ports, harbors, airports, all those things provide capital. And it is totally, you know, heterogeneous. It is totally non-fungible. If a company that had that capital in the form of not only human know-how, but the organization to put those 10 people that know those things in the right structure, organized in the right way, that company goes out of business. That is not in any way additive to uh, you know, the oil company. And even if the oil company would hire those 10 people just randomly in the market, and those 10 people slot into the oil company's um, you know, corporate structure in some way, they're not in any way leveraging what that, that little firm had built. That capital is gone and then sure those people know what they know and they're rehired and you know, made available, but something is lost. And there's a, a non-fungibility to it that um, is not 
uh, as Jeff very aptly said, not well understood or even recognized outside of uh, of Austrian schools. Uh, you know, folks, with, with with some exceptions, I think there's some on the monetary side that kind of get that to some degree, but they do they do want to get back to their macro aggregate equations. They do want capital to be, you know, like a scalar, like one number that you plug in, uh, or maybe two or three, I suppose, but uh, which is just totally wrong. It's not modelable that way. Um, the other thing that I remember uh, really thinking about, and I think Fekete talked about this a bit, is if you're trying to write an equation to describe the economy, like you're like you're modeling particles of an ideal gas in physics, um, the problem is people are not particles of an ideal gas. They're pesky because they have reason and volition and preferences, and they react, and then they remember. They're stateful as well. But, you know, like so. You know, you 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 run them through a boom bust cycle, and then you try to stimulate the boom again, and you don't get the same re response function out of people because they remember. They're still smarting from the last one, and their balance sheets are impaired from the last one. So there's all this stuff going on that particles of hydrogen gas bouncing around in a container do not. Uh, you know, uh, experience and, and don't do, but people do. And so that whole approach of just write an equation, you know, let alone the entrepreneur, just even the consumers, write an equation to model the consumers is a fool's errand at best. And maybe a completely um, disingenuous court economist trick to, um, to nudge people in, into uh, accepting the central plan at worst. Jeff, I want to bring it to you. Why don't we use terms like aggregate demand, just get a function? I mean, I, I do ask myself this sometime. If it truly is math, are you saying that the thousands of PhD economists who the Fed hires can't do math? I mean, if it's just one simple equation, you would think after a while they'd figure the economy out. Well, MV equals PQ, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> now, I mean, it is it is interesting that they call this physics envy when the when the social sciences want to use the methods of the natural or physical sciences to prove things. Uh, in other words, you look at some data, you create a hypothesis, and then you go out and test it empirically. Well, that that's all well and good, and that has, certainly has a place in economics. But the idea that you know human beings are not atoms, human beings are not molecules, human beings are not the same thing as uh, uh, physical elements in the natural world. And so as Keith mentioned, you know, not only are they rational and spiteful and they have memories, but they also can be irrational. They can also be unpredictable. They can do all kinds of things uh, that make, in, in my view anyway, modeling um, a, a fool's errand. And we saw that. I mean, we saw some of the most brilliant uh, academic economists in the United States dead wrong in that period like 05 to 07 about the state of the economy, about the state of the housing market, for example, a rational exuberance, you know, I, I mean, so if, if models are wrong, then maybe the actual idea of modeling is wrong. Human beings don't fit into these categories. We can't test them the same way we test things in physics or chemistry. But beyond that, I think just the idea of looking at economics more broadly, again, as, as scarcity, and within, within that context of scarcity, uh, making choices and taking actions uh, really helps us understand that economics is for everybody, right? It's not some highly specialized thing that only a handful of really brilliant PhD technocrats should even attempt to understand. Now, now clearly we should have, and, and we need PhD economists, but, but you know, not everyone's a PhD in math, but we certainly wouldn't send our kids out in the world unprepared to make change at a cash register, right? We wouldn't want to send our kids out into the world unable to write grammatically correct, complete sentences, but we don't expect them all to be English professors. I, I would argue that some basic economics, uh, economic competence ought to be a mainstay of at least high school programs. Um, I, I personally, I didn't have econ in high school. I didn't have it until undergrad. I don't know how, if that's common or not these days, but um, it, it's, you know, it, it's unfortunate because there's there's two two twin and forces at work. One is just mass widespread economic ignorance, and you know, Key said this sort of aggressive ignorance towards things. You know, people just just consider economics completely outside of their of their world or their worldview, and not something they need to consider. Or when or that economics is this incredibly specialized hyper-technical discipline that you have to have a PhD. And if you don't have one, you should just shut your pie hole. 
Jeff, who was it? I which, disagree. Which which PhD Nobel laureate was it who said that you if you don't have a PhD in economics, then basically shut the hell up? This was like 10 years ago, I think. Boy, that <laughs> I don't know the answer to that, but I I could think of a few who who would think that way for sure. There, there was somebody who said that, and it was basically an attempt to say, yeah, sure, everything I'm saying is completely irrational and I've been proven wrong on so many occasions, but unless you have a PhD. You don't even count. Go away. You, you, you don't know why I was wrong. <laughs> In effect. But let's not forget, it wasn't that long ago. Uh, for instance, when Hayek's Road to Serfdom came out in the late 1940s, that was actually condensed and serialized in Reader's Digest. Okay, so we're, we're li- the average lay person in the late 1940s was thought that they could they could grasp and understand a book like that and actually enjoy it as pleasurable reading in their free time at home with Reader's Digest. So this idea that economics is beyond most people's uh, ability to comprehend, I think is just dead wrong. You're here. So Jeff, I wanna kind of, as we end here, ask you uh, an important question, which is, listen, I do think the Austrians are right. I think we should think about capital. I think we should use economics to kind of further civilization, well-being. But um, most people aren't listening. Most people are continuing to do things that we know are wrong, uh, that are consuming capital, that are harming people. Um, So at this point, why not just wait? Let all those fiat currencies collapse like you know they're going to. Let the dollar eventually fall. And then me and you can take our Austrian flag. We can stand on the pile of rubble and wave it and say, I told you so. I mean, Mm -hmm. why, why come to monetary metals? Why not get in your bunker and just say, well, I'll wait till Janet Yellen blows the whole thing up. Well, I think we all have a responsibility to ourselves and to the truth, first and foremost. I mean, it, it doesn't do you much good to, in a Mad Max world to plant your flag and say, see, we're, we were right. You know, the uh, uh, Say's law was correct, um, you know, while we're foraging for food or something. Uh, you know, and, and I think it would be interesting someday to have a, a show about where Keith and I might disagree. It would be, it would be interesting to have a show on Austrian orthodoxy, maybe, versus heresy. Uh, I think that would be fun as well. But no, I, I think the I don't like the idea of accelerationism. This has sometimes been discussed in, I guess, what we call free market or libertarian circles that, you know, in, with the entitlements and with the structure of debt and the dollar, this is all going to hell. So just, you know, for, don't, don't worry about it. No, I, I disagree. I, I think we owe it to ourselves and to our prosperity to fight and try to make things better. And because that's our obligation for having the, the material the wonderful material level lives that we have relative to our grandparents or great grandparents, we owe them that. And, and more importantly, there have been much darker times in US history. I mean, people have been through all kinds of terrible things, you know, the Great Depression, the Civil War. I mean, for, given the relative comfort in which we sit, I, I think it would be absolutely craven to not go out there and try to have some effect on the world. And, and Monetary Metals is trying to do that in, 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 as a proof. In other words, in a business setting, profit is the proof. That, that's the proof that gold works. And the idea that, that that aforementioned CEO of Honda has to sit around worrying about monetary policy, along with everything else he has to worry about to make Hondas, to, it strikes me as an absolute tragedy. And if, if we could get money right in this country and in this world, uh, an awful lot of human time and energy could then be expended on actual production of real goods and services instead of having to worry about how to constantly hedge against these terrible depredations, these central bankers. So, no, I, I, I think we have a, an obligation, not, not, in the, uh, not in the sacrificial, uh, altruistic, uh, Randian sense, but in, in the sense of, you know, just our own, uh, you know, standing as, as human beings who want to have self-respect. I think we have an obligation to, to be forthright and forceful in what we see as truth. Absolutely. Keith, it's going to be hard to go up after that, but I'm going to send it your way. I, I think, um, I, I'm trying to remember who said this, but uh, suppose, you know, your, your, uh, you know, your girlfriend or wife, somebody you love, is about to fall off the edge of a cliff and you see this and you're like a mile away and you're not necessarily close enough to stop the tragedy. Do you just sit down and have a beer and just say, oh, well, or do you run for your life 
to try to get there. Hopefully, maybe you don't necessarily have a hope, but you just have to run because you have to. Um, and I, I think, you know, I've said this many times, but the collapse of the currency coincides with the collapse of our civilization. The nearest analog we have is 476 AD, when that civilization collapsed, at least in, in Western Rome. And, um, you know, the city of Rome had a population of well over a million people. And after the collapse, it was like 6,000 or 8,000 people. So there's enormous loss of life uh, associated with this. And you can get a bunker, right? So in, in, in 2009, 2010, you know, I looked around the world and, you know, kind of found South Island, New Zealand to be an interesting place to try to survive a collapse because it had basically the combination of fertile land, plenty of rainfall, because you're not going to have electric pumps in that world. So the water has to fall out of the sky. A livestock to people ratio of 20 to one or something like that. Good, strong work ethic. That was not going to be a Mad Max sort of a place. But even now when civilization is holding together, it's a bleak place. I mean, you're, you know, 15 miles from, I mean, and you'd be picking it deliberately. You didn't want to be near a city because the cities are going to collapse. 15 miles from a crossroads town that has a little sort of half grocery store. Um, and, you know, barely in the internet and all these things even now. And, um, you know, I looked at this and said, okay, even assuming you survive the Mad Max zombie apocalypse of the collapse itself, and you have sufficient storage of dried food and all those things, when you reemerge, the best possible hope is to reemerge into an 18th century agrarian, you know, world. And let's not forget, that was a world where you know, 14 hour days, six six days a week of backbreaking toil produced a bare subsistence. And that's when there wasn't, uh, you know, some sort of pestilence that wiped out your crop or potato famine or whatever. Um, and, you know, life was very hard, very meager, and it was a young person's world. You know, life expectancy was 35 to 40 uh, in those days. So I looked at that and, um, you know, uh, I was already past my shelf life even then, you know, back in 2009, 2010, let alone now, I said, <clears throat> I don't necessarily expect I would survive in that world. I don't necessarily think I would want to try. Um, and uh, I went all in to try to avert that disaster. That's what, you know, Jeff, Jeff describes it as a proof of concept. But um, I'm trying to avert that disaster by uh, bringing monetary change uh, the bottom up entrepreneurial way. Now, there's no hope or, you know, certainly no guarantee. It seems in a way crazy and, and audacious that we're going to run that mile before she, you know, falls over the edge of the cliff and she's two feet away and we're trying to run a mile. Um, but there doesn't seem to be any other choice. If you see the facts that way, as I do, what else could you do? And I, I think there's a responsibility if you want to live and you want to ensure your own future. And if you care about uh, anybody else in this world, um, then you do what you can, and and not out of any sacrificial duty, but out of a profoundly selfish sense of I like civilization. I think man has achieved quite a pinnacle of uh, you know it's not just that we have lives of comfort and ease, but just there's so many great things that all of, virtually all of human knowledge is available on the internet. And you know if I'm sitting there at dinner uh, arguing with somebody over some fact or another. All of that is actually accessible from a little uh, a skinny little phone that I have in my pocket. I mean, you, you know, it, it's great in every, in every level. Medical science has improved. There's, there's so many things that, you know, why would anybody want to give that up? And so um, that's, uh, that's, my, that's my answer to that. And, and I do want to let the audience know, uh, Michael Malice just wrote this book. It's called The White Pill, and, and it kind of does discuss this kind of hope not that there's a guarantee of winning, but it's not certain that we're going to lose. Um, and he kind of goes through some of the worst periods in time, you know, when communism was just a sure thing. Communism is never going away. That Iron Curtain is going to be up forever. And we just live in a bipolar world. And then, you know, peacefully, almost overnight, we lived um, and, and the Soviet Union fell. I'm lucky enough to be here because of that fact. Um, so, Jeff, I kind of want to say, what is a question now that we've kind of painted a scene here of the importance of 
obviously what monetary metals is doing, the, the kind of dire circumstances we've been put in by this kind of central planning regime. What's a question that we should be asking all our future guests on the podcast? And maybe what do you see as kind of a path forward here? And, and, and how does monetary metals play into that? That is, that is always the thought, you know, what to do. I think that's a great question for any guests. You know, how do we move forward? What's, what's the path forward? And, and the, in the entrepreneurial world, you're always dealing with tremendous uncertainty. Every entrepreneur is, is groping in the dark. You know, you, you, our future is unwritten and you have to build it. It's, it's not just out there to be discovered. And, and so I think that's the question for any guest you might have. Like, give, given what you've said about the state of things or, uh, or the money issues or central banking or whatever it might be, what should we do? What do you recommend to people? And for some people, that could be just recommending a book or something to them that might be eye-opening. And there's other people that you might say, hey, look, because of where you are in life, use the, the, the levers, which Keith mentioned, to, to help us uh, tilt the axis of this world and, and everything in between. But uh, none of this matters if, if we're not acting. All of this, you know, no, no amount of theory wor works if we're not attempting to apply it. So that's, that's the question. And, and of course, I was asked that a lot at the Mises Institute. Well, what should we do? What should I do? What can I do? And uh, th there's no one pat answer for everybody, but we, some of your guests have a lot of special knowledge and, and some of your guests are probably wealthy and some of your guests are very accomplished and have uh, a lot of education and knowledge. And so they're particularly well suited, I think, to answer that question. What should we be doing? Jeff, what should we be doing? Great question. I will be asking that for future guests. I want to thank you so much for coming onto the Gold Exchange podcast, your first, but definitely not your last. Jeff, thanks so much. And we look forward to working with you at Monetary Metals. Thanks, gentlemen. Welcome aboard. This episode was brought to you by Monetary Metals. Monetary Metals is a different kind of gold company. Others buy and sell gold. Monetary Metals operates the Gold Yield Marketplace, a platform of products that offer a yield on gold paid in gold to investors and institutions, and our gold financing simplified, reliable financing denominated in gold with a built-in hedge for gold using and gold producing businesses. To learn more, visit www.monetary-metals.com. See you next time.